Well, good morning. Welcome to our fourth and final week of this series, People of the Second Chance. Um, I really want to encourage you, as Pastor Will did earlier, to, to uh, come to the marriage series next week, to invite somebody you know. Uh, that may, We all know somebody that needs to hear that. If you're, if you're not married and, and you're thinking, sweet, six weeks off. Um, no. Um, in, in fact, it, I'll, I'll tell you how you'll know if this will be relevant to you. So I want you to, to, to put your hand out like this in front of your face, okay? Now breathe. <sighs> okay, did you feel breath on your hand? Yeah. That means you're alive, um, which means you're in relationships, which means you need to hear this series. So everybody needs to come. You need to invite a friend. And so, uh, yeah, that's how we're going to do that. Everybody come. But I've been a pastor um, <clears throat> going on like 15 years, give or take, and probably the number one question I get asked, I have people say to me all the time, you're a pastor? You don't seem like a pastor. Thank you. Okay. Um, but but they, uh, they say, how, did you, how in the world did you end up in ministry? And, and my answer, I think, surprises people. I say to them, because I couldn't get away. And I tried. Like, I really tried. Like, like I almost didn't up in, end up in ministry. I, I grew up in the church. I grew up involved in youth group, and I played on the worship team in high school, and I, uh, I knew what was expected of me for the most part. Uh, I, I tried to live up to that. I, I knew what I was supposed to do and not supposed to do and all, all those things. Uh, but I never gave ministry a second thought. That wasn't even on my radar until the end of my senior year of high school. And God began to very closely speak to me and say, you know, I want you to be a pastor. And I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't like that. I've shared before. I, that was, I wasn't interested in that. Um, and so I very reluctantly, very um, cynically uh, enrolled, trying to be obedient, enrolled in, uh, at, in Oklahoma Western University as a ministry major. <clears throat> I got into classes and it became obvious very quickly, uh, you know that saying, one of these things is not like the others. <laughs> that was me. Everybody else was like a theological egghead or they, they, you know, third or fourth generation pastor's kid. And then there's this guy. And, and I, I, I didn't think like they thought. I didn't know what they knew. I was completely in over my head. I was completely intimidated and I was completely cynical. And, and that's how I started my freshman year. Now, I don't know during that year exactly the moment that I formulated my plan of escape. But I came up with a plan. I, I, I decided, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to run away. Now, again, I grew up in church. So I'd read Jonah. Okay? I know how this ends. But I thought, we're in Oklahoma. We're landlocked. I'm probably pretty safe. What could happen? Um, and the rest of my semester, I just drifted. The rest of my year, I just drifted. And by the end of that year, I was in full-on rebellion. I, I told my friends, not only am I done with... with um, the ministry, I'm done with God. I just don't want to do this anymore. And, and, I left, uh, and I left campus that year with all my stuff and in all of my maturity as like a 19-year-old rebelling, I actually gave the school the finger. Like, what did that prove? But I did that and I drove off and I, I headed home and I proceeded to, in quick succession, wreck my life wreck everything that I, that I knew. Like my, I, I went to every party that I possibly could, even the parties of the people I didn't like very much, uh, because I had one goal in life that summer. I wanted to be uh, drunk as often as possible. And the reason I wanted to be drunk as often as possible is because I didn't want to feel anything. Most, mostly, I just didn't want to feel my, you know, God's disappointment with me. And, and that's how I spent my summer. And, and by the end of the summer, I was totally lost. I'd lost my faith in who God was. I, I'd lost all purpose and direction uh, in my life uh, through a series of bad choices. Uh, I lost my virginity that summer, and, and once that was gone, I felt like I lost my value, and nothing really mattered anymore. And, and we all know that phrase, you know, I've hit rock bottom. We, we know what that means, but until you've been there, you don't, do you? And once you've been there, you're like, oh, oh, this is what that means. Well, that's where I was. I was at the bottom, and that's where God found me. And he used a friend in my life to confront me. And I won't even tell you uh, where she found me, but she confronted me. She said, you know, God's got a call in your life and you know you're not supposed to be here doing this. And I, I shared some choice words with her and then I passed out. And I woke up the next day uh, at my home, in, in my bed. I have no idea how I got there. But in that moment, I realized something. I have epically failed. I have failed myself. I have failed my friends and my family. And most of all, I've just, I failed God. And I thought to myself, it's over. This call, this call to ministry, it's done. I called my friend up that day and I told her, you know, I need your help getting back on track. You're absolutely right. Now, hit the pause button on the story. Again, I grew up in church, right? 
So I knew there was grace. Like I knew I'd mess up royally, but I knew, uh, I knew about Jesus and that he died for my sins and, and I thought, oh, he can forgive me. And I, I began legitimately journeying my way back to him. I just figured, you know, he's going to pick up the pieces of, of the, make a mess. I made a mess. He's going to make something out of that brokenness. But that ministry thing, that was over. So I began to attend church and, and reconnect and read the scriptures and grow and learn in, in a way that I had maybe never done in my life. I was, I was growing closer to God. My, my depth of relationship with him was growing but I just knew ministry was done, or at least I thought ministry was done. And then I, I, my phone rang. And to date the story a little bit, this is before cell phones, so I mean like, you know, bring, hello, oh, cord, you know. Uh, my phone rang, and, and I picked it up, and, and it was my youth pastor. And he wanted to meet, and I thought, oh, here it comes, because I knew um, how Christians can be, right? Uh, you know, critical, judgmental, eat, eat their own young, you know. Um, <laughs> At least that was a picture in my head, and I figured he was going to light me up. You know, he's just going to lay into me. And in a way, he kind of did, but it wasn't what I thought it would be. He, he sat me down across from him, and he said, Phil, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm meeting with you. <laughs> no, 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 no. What are you doing here? Well, this is where you told me to meet you. No, Phil, you're not, you're not paying attention. Listen, I don't mean what are you doing here today. I mean, why are you still here? Yes, you messed up royally. You blew it. I get that. When are you going to allow God's grace to work in you? And when are you going to get back? He said these words, when are you going to get back on your ministry track? Now, that conversation changed the trajectory of my life. Because that was the first time since I'd royally blown it that a thought entered my mind. Maybe God's not actually done with me. Maybe his grace is big enough. And that started a journey back. In the spring semester, I re-enrolled at Oklahoma Wesleyan University. My major was, once again, pastoral ministry. And I can tell you a hundred stories of grace, of friends that I'd walked away from that welcomed me back with open arms, of, of my roommate that I got in a fight with before I left school that year, slammed the door in his face, and, and I knocked on the door, because I'm staying with him again, and he opened the door, and he just said two words. He said, welcome home. I can tell you about my professors, who knew why I left, knew what I did, and they showed me incredible grace as I began this journey back. And if it wasn't for that grace, the Ransom Church isn't here today, okay? And, and, and that season of my life shaped me, and, and that season of life taught me a truth that we all need to hear. Here it is. Failure isn't fatal. I don't know what your failure is. I don't know how big it is. I don't know how long it is. I don't know how many things you've done, but failure isn't fatal. I do know that. So turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. We'll be on page 703 if you're using one of our Bibles. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, uh, you can just raise your hand. The ushers will run you one. You can turn to page 703, follow along. If you don't own a Bible, please raise your hand and we'll just give you one as a gift. Uh, page 703, Galatians chapter 6. Now we're in the final week of the series and, and we're going to deal with a question that I think that we all need to face in the church. Uh, what do you do when you sin? What do you do when you fail, when, when you fall on your face? 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9. We're going to get there. You're stealing my punchline. Uh, <laughs> what do you do when you fall on your face? Uh, here, here's the reality, because we've all sinned, we've all done this, but listen, here's how most people answer that question. Most people don't answer it 1 John 1.9. Most people say, I have absolutely no idea. And that's Christians and non-Christians alike. Like we've been talking about how we're in a spiritual battle and when you're in a spiritual battle, there are always going to be casualties, right? Like we got the armor of God on, we're fighting this battle and yet at times you let your guard down, don't you? We, we all do, we all, we all make mistakes. There are going to be times as we go through life that, that one of Satan's fiery darts are going to pierce a brother or sister in Christ. You, you, we're going to hear stories about pastors who have moral failures. That, that's going to happen. We're going to hear stories about spouses who choose to be unfaithful and teenagers who are in rebellion and, and, and young unmarried couples who, who get too close and, and they get pregnant and they didn't mean to. And bottom line, you're going to see these stories of, of these temptations that sweep believers off their feet. And I don't think that's a surprise. I think we know that, right? What we don't maybe know is what is the church supposed to do? How, how are we supposed to react? Uh, that is the question we're going to try to answer today from Galatians chapter 6. So let's jump in with verse 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, 
If another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Now, we use New Living Translation uh, here. It's it's a really great translation. We, We like it a lot. But here I want you to hear the NIV because I think the New International Version, uh, just the words paint some pictures I want you to see. It says this, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you got that picture? They're caught in a sin. You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. So what does it look like for us as believers? How do we react when the people around us, the people sitting next to us, the people we know the best fall? when they fail, when they blow it. First, when someone is down, restore them. When someone is down, restore them. The the fact about God is this. We serve a God of second chances. That's who he is. Now, we don't always see him that way, and the reason we don't always see him that way is because us, broken, imperfect humans, are the representation here on earth, and we sometimes mess that up. But when you look at Scripture, the message of the second chance fills the pages of Scripture. You can hardly look at the people that God used, the heroes of the faith, without seeing their initial failures. You got Moses. This is a guy that, you know, let my people go, delivers, you know, ten plagues, and then they come in the Red Sea and it parts, and then they go up on the mountain and get the Ten Commandments. This dude, he's got it together. When Moses started out, God says, I want you to deliver my people. Moses says, I got this. And he kills a dude, Right? He kills an Egypt. That's how he starts out. He blows it. He runs off. He's hiding on the backside of the desert as a shepherd for 40 years. You're living life as a shepherd. And God comes to him after 40 years and says, hey, remember that plan? I still want to use you. And he gives him a second chance. Then you got David, you know, a man after God's own heart. Scripture doesn't describe anybody else that way. He's a man after God's own heart. Great king, totally faithful until one day, He sees a woman bathing. He lusts after her, finds out she's married, but he sleeps with her anyway. He gets her pregnant, tries to cover it up, has to end up having her husband killed to cover it up. God sends a prophet, Nathan, confronts him, he repents, and David's given what? A second chance. And then you got Jonah. You know, he's called a priest to the Ninevites, and he hates those guys. And so Jonah does what I did. He ran away, but he he ran, you know, hundreds of miles in the wrong direction. He gets on a boat and just sails in the wrong direction. And God uses a storm and a whale to get his attention. God calls him again, and Jonah's given a second chance. You see, you see the pattern? And you can just keep going. Paul, you know, Peter, like it doesn't, doesn't matter who it is. God is a God of second chances. Despite all of these failures, God uses those who turn their backs on him to do his work. He's a gracious God willing to give second chances. My question is, why doesn't the church, and I don't mean this church or the church, I mean like we are the body of Christ. Why do Christians, why do we so often not look like that? Why is it so often the tendency in the church to either jump to kicking people out or never letting them in? Like scripture describes the church as the body of Christ. And so the picture is that Jesus is the head and we are the body doing, we got all the different parts and all the parts need each other. And and so you got this, this metaphor of the body in your head and yet too often we see people around us and life has left them broken. And while we cannot overlook their sin and we should not overlook their sin, how often does the church too quickly jump to amputation? Just cut off the body part, right? Now, listen, if you go to the, the hospital today because you fall and you break your arm or you realize you got an infection in your leg, if you walk in, you're like, doctor, my leg's, I got this infection. It's kind of, and he's like, amputate. I'm getting a second opinion, right? Like I'm not, um, I think you're jumping to conclusions because what we know is that doctors will look at that injury and they will exhaust all other resources before they get to the last resort. Listen, amputation is seen as a last resort, not as a first line of defense. So why is it when it comes to the body of Christ, too often what should be the last option we tend to jump to before we show any grace? Oh, they're doing what? Oh, amputate. Now, listen, here's what this doesn't mean. We, we need to hear this. This doesn't mean we diminish sin, okay? It doesn't mean we diminish sin. Uh, we're not making excuses for people's sins. We're not treating sin as inconsequential. When you read uh, the story in John chapter 10 of the woman caught in adultery, Jesus says two things to her. He says, I don't condemn you. Go and 
sin no more, right? I mean, he's dealing with both sides of this equation. It doesn't mean that we, don't, that we diminish sin and we make it not a big deal. It also doesn't mean that we just ignore sin, that when sin is happening, we just, la, 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 we just that, that's not what it means. When someone's soul is wounded by sin, this is not a call to stand by in indifference and just ignore it. Ignoring sin doesn't make it go away. What this is a call is to understand what is God's role and what is my role in all of this. Here's what I mean. Paul says, if you call yourself a Christian, you ought to live like one, and here's your role. He says, brothers and sisters, if you see someone caught in sin, you should judge them. Oh, wait, no, that's not... Um, It says, if you see someone caught in sin, you should restore them gently. That's our job. Now, to be caught in sin, the, the word here is literally to be trapped. So, I don't, know what your, I don't know what your days are like. I don't know what your life is like for a lot of you. But listen, if you failed in this life and you feel trapped by your past mistakes, if, if you're living life right now and you're like, my life is a mess. You're fighting an addiction. You're dealing with a bunch of debt from bad spending. You're in over your heads financially. Uh, you're in a broken relationship. You've got these this history, these demons from your past, and because of it, you're having trouble getting employment, whatever the case may be, like whatever those things are, your failure doesn't have to be fatal. Okay. Uh, The things that you're ashamed about definitely need a problem, definitely need healing. You definitely need restoration and that will be a journey, but it doesn't have to be fatal. God wants to offer you a second chance. On the flip side of that coin, if you're a Christian in the room, you're a believer, you say, I believe in Jesus Christ, I put my faith in him, I've accepted, what you've accepted is your second chance, right? You're living a second chance. Now, we're not supposed to keep that to ourselves. We're supposed to take the grace of God that he has given us and we're to give it away to others. That's our role. Paul says, if you call yourself a Christian, restore those around you. Isn't that interesting? Now, restore here in the Greek Uh, The Greek is a very pictorial language. It's it's full of lots of beautiful pictures. Uh, Restore here, uh, I want to show you a couple pictures. This is the same word used over in Mark chapter 1 when we see the picture of the disciples and they're getting their fishing equipment all ready and they're mending their nets. So, So the picture that we need to get here, this same Greek word for mending is used here. So what this passage is saying is, listen, when those around you fail, it's your job to mend them. That's, that's a pretty different picture than we sometimes see, isn't it? And if that weren't beautiful enough, the same word elsewhere is used for the resetting of a broken bone. So the picture there is, listen, when, when people around you and, and they're struggling, not only do you help them mend, bo- mend their brokenness, you have to help reset their life. You help get them back in place. You help get them right on the right track. Here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say if there's someone around you and they're a complete mess, throw the net away. It doesn't say if there's someone around you and they're a mess, cut the leg off. It says when someone's around you, bring restoration and do so gently. See, too many of us, we've defined restoration as it's my job to restore you, so now I'm going to beat you to death with the truth, right? It's my job to help you know how wrong you were. I need to make sure you feel it. See, but when we do that, what we're doing is we're playing judge. And what Paul is saying is, That's not your role. That role belongs to somebody else, and he's much bigger than you. Your role, God's role is to be judged. Your role is restore them gently. Let the grace you've received become grace for others. You see it? Then second, when someone is weak, carry them. When someone is weak, carry them. Look at verse 2. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. To share here is literally to, to carry or to bear. It's, it's this picture of putting someone else's burdens on your shoulders. In other words, the call of the church is to help people carry the things in their life that they can't carry on their own. Now, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times in life I've needed someone to help me bear my burdens for a short season, but I want you to note something. This is really important to understanding this. There's a difference between a burden and a load, okay? There's a difference between a burden and a load. When you keep reading Galatians chapter 6, in verse 4 and 5, you're going to read something that sounds almost contradictory to bearing one another's burden. You're going to see it uh, in verses 4 and 5. Uh, this is in the NIV. It says this, each one should test their own actions, 
Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. Watch, for each one should carry their own load. And you might go, this seems contradictory. One minute we're bearing each other's burdens, the next minute we're carrying, each other, carrying our own load. What, what's the story here? But there's a difference between burden and load. We are all to carry our own load and to carry each other's burdens. Both of these are shipping terms. Okay? Load is all about capacity. Load equals capacity. Your load is what you can bear and should bear on your own. Every single person, every single one of us has a load in, in life that's simply ours to carry. Based on the family you're in, the job you have, whatever, you have a load that you've been expected to carry, and it's your load. It's not my job to carry it. I got my own load, right? Burden equals overcapacity. Burden is when your ship is overloaded and you're starting to sink and you need someone to come alongside you and offload some of the weight so you don't sink. That's the picture of bearing burdens. Now, here, here's the truth. Every single one of us has a load in life. I am not responsible to carry your load. And you are not responsible to carry my load. But every now and then, the load gets too heavy, doesn't it? Every now and then, whether it's something, something happens, you, you, know, you lose a loved one, or you make a huge mistake, or, or you, you know, you, whatever the case may be, there's a large stressor in your life. Every once in a while, the load gets too heavy, and what happens to your life? You become burdened, and you begin to sink. And what we need in that time as a church is that we need to come alongside and help people carry their burdens. Paul says that's the job of believers. Unless you think it's not your job, he warns us in verse 3. He says, if you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. <laughs> I, love, I, I just hate that he beats around the bush, you know? <laughs> He's like, listen, you're not that important. You, you want to know the greatest burden that people will ever face? The weight of their sin. That's the greatest burden the people around you will ever face. The weight of their own sin sins. So what does it mean to be the church in those moments? What it means is when those around us wake up and they realize that they are sinking and the weight of their own sin is bearing down on them, that being the church means we're going to be there to bear their burden. Will we be there to bear their burden with them or will we just let them sink, just keep our hands clean, unwilling to count the cost? Because there are people around you right now and they're over capacity in life. What will we do about it? At the ransom, like it's in who we are. We exist to set captives free. That's what we want to do. We want to be part of the solution. And maybe for you, that means helping with the closet, you know, and, and handing out clothes when people, when that's a need for them. Or maybe it's getting involved with safe families and taking the burden off these moms that are trying to balance life. Maybe for you, it's going on a poetis trip to, to Zambia and working with the orphans there. Maybe, maybe it's going to Casas for Cristo and building a house in the Dominican Republic or, or Juarez for a family in need. Or maybe for you, it's just getting into a life group and being a friend to those around you. Maybe it's seeing somebody in the lobby and you notice they're down and you put their, your arm around them and you just say, hey, how, how, you do, how can I help you out today? Will we be the church or will we just let people drown? And then third, and I think, I think this is actually the hardest one, ready? When someone needs a second chance, give it to them. When someone needs a second chance, it's our job to give it to them. Look at verse 10 of Galatians chapter 6. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. So a little quiz here to see if you're paying attention. Who should we be good to? All people. Who, who do you think, who is included in all people? Yeah, like, like all people, right? <laughs> like everyone. This doesn't mean do good to those people who do sins that you know are bad, but they're really not that offensive to you. They don't cross your line. It doesn't mean do good to those people that you really, really like or to those people that you know really well. This is do good to all people. That's people who, who have failed and, and whose marriages are taken and are broken homes and broken lives and they're facing addiction. They've got a history of failure. This is our call to be a church where we can declare ourselves to be a community where people can come in broken and find a second chance. That's what the Bible mandates. Like, how many of you have used... Um, one of your second chances with God, right? Or two or a million, right? Or whatever. Like, if you get a second chance, why would we not give that to others? 
And the truth is here at the Ransom, we're actually pretty good at this because this is a, a big focus for us. And so if you're brand new here and you're from outside the church and you're wondering, will I, will I be accepted? Will, will people love me here? You're going to find a place here where you can mend and heal and grow. And yes, we're going to confront your sin and walk through things, but we're also going to help you experience a second chance. We're going to do so gently. I promise that. But, but if you go here, if this is your regular church, what about those inside the church? Here's where I think this gets hard. Look at verse 10 again. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Now listen, <laughs> especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Why do you have to go there? This is odd to me that he would put this in. Uh, listen, it's easy to show grace to a new person, isn't it? It's easy to show grace to someone that you don't really know or that you, you're pretty sure they don't know Christ or you're pretty sure they don't know better. What about when they do know better? What about someone, like Paul says, as long as we have opportunity, let us give grace to all people, especially those who believe. Why does he have to go there? Because he knows it's hardest to show grace to those who know better. Why? Because they know better. It's like, what's wrong with you, man? You know this stuff. Come on, you know? And it's hard to show grace to those who know better because they're without excuse. And yet, here we are, we're the body of Christ, and we're one together in Christ, which means I need you. And, and as much as you may not like it, you need me. Like we're, we're you know, we're all in this together. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's the last service, things happen, I don't know. Um, but listen, think about your life. When you slip up, when you fall, when you fail, when you sin, what do you want from the body of Christ? Do you want judgment or do you want grace? Which, which one do you want to receive? And if you, if you want to receive that, why would you not want to give that to others? Let me, let me test that. Watch this story with me. So here's a question, um, and don't answer it out loud, but answer it in, in your heart. Is God's grace big enough for Cody? Yes. Was it, was it big enough for me? Yes. We, we have these lines that we draw, and we just go, nope. Grace ends there, but, but according to Scripture, we all need a second chance. In fact, we all need countless second chances. I needed a friend to, to call me out. I needed a youth pastor to call me up. I needed friends to take me back. I needed the church to be the church. I, I needed to, to deal with my sin. I needed to, to work through those issues, but it all started with the grace of a second chance. Cody, Cody had a lot to work through, Right? But he needed people who would believe in him as, even as he was walking, believe in his restoration. He needed people who would give him a second chance. Now, he needed to work through his, his sin issues and, and, and work it through the, all, all of those things that he, they wrestled with. But at the end of the day, it started with the grace of a second chance. And, and here's the deal. God knew that you would need your second chances. He knew you, where you would mess up. And he loved you so much that he sent his son to die in our place. And, and he's promised us in 1 John 1, 9. He's promised us, listen, and there are no stipulations to this. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is all about second chances. Are we? Are we? So here, here's, uh, in, a, in a kind of a moment of vulnerability, well, let's start with an easy one. Is there anybody in the room who would raise their hand and say, I have needed a second chance from God? Right? Okay, now, a little more vulnerable question. Is there anybody who would say, right now, you know, maybe the person next to you doesn't know, they don't know what's going on in your life, but right now, I could really use a second chance. Yeah. So, listen, look around, see these hands. If, if you're the body of Christ, it's your job to restore them gently. Do not look at those hands and ignore them. It's your job to be the body of Christ. And so then I want to give you everybody an opportunity to kind of commit to something together. Now, this isn't, this isn't a binding legal contract or covenant. We're not like, you know, this is just an exercise, a symbolic exercise. But if you'd be willing to make a commitment, at the bottom of your, your hub outline, there's a, a little commitment there. And here's what I'm going to, I'm holding the Bible. And if you want to join me, I'm going to have you raise your right hand, right? We're going to take an oath together that we'll support each other as we read this together. So if you want to make this commitment, read this with me. We commit this day, in order to be more like Jesus, to be people of the second chance, to restore the broken around us, to carry the burdens of the weak, 
to give second chances generously as we live in the second chance that we've been given. So Father God, I pray right now, I pray right now that you would make us people of a second chance. And God, we've been talking about the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that we've received. And we've made being people of the second chance all about receiving that second chance, receiving that grace. But I pray that you would make us people of the second chance and that we would be people who give second chances to the, bro- the broken around us, to the lost around us. God, that we would exhibit grace first as we walk with people through their sins, as they heal, as they grow, but that we would begin with the grace that you have first shown us. I pray, Father, that you would help our hearts become hearts of the second chance. In Jesus' name, amen.